So uh, I have the privilege to uh, introduce uh, uh, Darlene Singer. Uh, Darlene Singer is a businesswoman, civic and community volunteer. Uh, previously, Singer was a member of the Naperville, Illinois uh, City Council. She worked to reduce property tax rates, uh, improve the city's infrastructure, and enhance the community's public safety network. In 2009, uh, she became a Republican member of the Illinois House of Representatives. Singer received award from the Illinois Chamber of Commerce and the Illinois Farm Bureau for her work to hold down taxes and promote economic opportunity. Singer earned her finance degree from Purdue University and later earned her uh, MBA from DePaul University. She's a mother of two, uh, of two, and I think they are sitting at the table. So welcome to Darlene, and welcome to the family and all of you. So Darlene, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, part of this family. But I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, this race, I'll give you a little bit about what my background is. Uh, you shared my education already. Uh, finance has been my, um, basically my education, my professional background. I started working um, out of Purdue for the First National Bank of Chicago. This was in the 80s, and this was in their trust department, and it was a really good time to be in Chicago in finance. We were doing a lot of good things here, and I had a good experience there. After that, I worked for a company in Chicago called SCI, and they were um, institutional pension consultants. So I worked there as the vice president for product development, basically putting quantitative numbers stuff together for the consultants, which was really good work. And then after that, um, I had a period of time, I was stayed home as a mom, which is probably the thing I like most, and my kids are looking at me, their story, and they, they go nuts when I tell the story, but they're gonna hear it again. Um, my, my children were, looking at them now, my kids were both premature. My son was two pounds, 13 ounces when he was born, and Michelle was one pound, 14 ounces, so they're very healthy kids, and I'm very blessed to have two healthy kids. And they're in Illinois, they're still here, which is a good thing, and I wanna keep them here, that's, that's part of it. Um, in 2002, I ran for uh, city council in Naperville. The story with that basically, it had to do with uh, where I was in District 204, this was the time when Naperville was growing like crazy. We were building schools like crazy, our property taxes were going up because we couldn't handle the population there. And my ad being added to the city council broke the tie with the developers in the school districts saying, okay, now we have to sit down and do planned growth, which I'm very glad for. So it kind of slowed things down a little bit, but it got us to the point where we could actually handle the capacity of new homes being built, and it kept some commercial there, which I was glad to see the planned growth there. And then in 2008, um, I was asked by, and this is, this is a story I share a lot too, I was asked by my girlfriends to run for city council, and once again, my girlfriend said, hey, you gotta, there's an opening here to run for state rep in Naperville, so I threw my hat in the ring for that that one, and if you recall, 2008 was the year Obama's on the ballot. So, you know, they're, basically the state was looking at this and saying, hey, tsunami for Republicans, and it was, it was a tsunami for Republicans. So I'm a target by Madigan, and I'm running for an open seat, and, and everybody, I mean, we're, we're falling like flies that year, and I won that seat, I beat Madigan by just a smidgen, which was a tough thing to do, so I learned how politics work firsthand. It was a very eye-opening experience, and it kept Republicans from being in the super minority, veto-proof majority by one that year. So after that, we lost it, but I learned the importance of balance in, in Springfield and what that means. Um, after that, I did a run for Congress in 2014 against Bill Foster. Lost that one, that's a very tough district to win in, but I'm glad I did that because I learned a lot. I learned a lot about listening, listening to people and learning more about what's really important to people. And that I like to bring, I'm, I'm glad to have that experience. And I share that experience and I have that additional ability now to really understand people. And then after, after that, I also had a really good experience. I worked for the Illinois Workers' Compensation Commission as their chief financial officer 
which I'm glad to have that because I work for an agency and I know how state agencies work, so to bring that to the table. And then for six months, I worked for the governor's office as deputy chief of staff for legislative affairs with some of my colleagues here and friends for, uh, for being here today. And that was a, that was, it was a busy time, no question. We had challenges in there. Really glad to have had that job. It was another really good experience. Um, I was fortunate, having been a former state representative, knew you know how the General Assembly worked. And we did some really good stuff that year, particularly in regards to holding some vetoes, some very important vetoes. The governor signed vetoes, and we kept them from being overridden. Uh, you don't hear those stories enough, but one of those had to do with the right to work laws, which local right to work laws, and some workers' compensation bills, which I'm glad to see that have happening. So a lot of what you hear is the hard work many times has to do more from having bad things happen, in our opinion, bad things happening and, and you know, fighting that fight. So that's, that's kind of my professional experience. Um, the other thing I'm gonna share with you, and I talked a little bit about uh, how I was a former pension consultant, did a lot of work in Springfield on the pension problem. And I want to share a little bit of that story. I had to do with Senate Bill 1, which the court basically uh, said we couldn't, it wasn't legal. It was diminishing and impair of the whole um, pension clause for the state. So I just wanted to share a little bit about how that process worked and why that process was so important and how I want to bring some of that to the comptroller's office, some of the bigger picture things. So we started, started working on the problem in 2001, actually, it was House Bill uh, 142. And a colleague of mine on the Democrat side, Representative Elaine Neckridge, she was the head of the pension committee in, out of Evanston, and I was the minority spokesperson for the pension committee. So we sat down in the summer of 2011, and we brought in everybody we could talk to in regards to analyzing the problem. We brought people in from out of state. We brought people, experts in from within. And we just started tackling and picking apart and analyzing you know, what this was really all about. So we spent one summer doing that. We did, spent the second summer doing that. We brought in more colleagues, Representative Biss at the time, then Senator Biss, and others joined us at the table, and this kept building, and we kept chipping away, and we kept trying, you know, putting things together and analyzing things, and, and we had everything on the table to look at, and we measured everything, and we called them levers, you know, and what, what lever basically moved the problem to a solution more than not. So we did that, and then coming up in 2013, we actually started crafting a bill, which was Senate Bill 1. And we worked, with, um, we worked with everyone again in the state, and this bill evolved to the point where there were actually two bills. There was one in the Senate and one in the House, um, and we actually had to go into what's called a conference committee, which we did. And what a conference committee is, is when you have two bills that can't be reconciled, Senate and House, you know, you sit down and you get a group and you, you kind of put the two things together. So we did that all summer. Um, we had basically, it was four of us that were working on it, um, two in the Senate and two in the House. Representative Neckritz and I were in the House. Uh, Senator Royal and Senator Murphy were in the Senate. And we worked all summer. And we compromised all summer. And we didn't give up all summer. And this was a year also, and I'll share, but Michelle, you were with me, which was crazy. This, this was, there was one day where uh, Governor Quinn came in and said, you know what? We're not going to pay these legislators until they get this pension problem solved. And I'm looking at it and go, well, I'm, we've been working on it every day, and, and Governor, you haven't been at the table. <laughs> so I took the back of my notepad and said, we'll work without pay. <laughs> and Michelle was with me, and we're, we're in the Thompson Center, and I, I hold this up, they go, who the hell are you? I go, we're working on this thing. So we did, we really, we, and here's how it got done, guys. This is, this is a good story, this is how it got done. We had a group of us that found each other, and we worked together. And how we worked together, we compromised, but we trusted each other. And that trust was so important. So that trust was when we disagree or we could not come up with something, we, did, we kept it quiet. We said, let's regroup, let's come back. And we kept chipping away. So we got stuff done. And we weren't going out to say, let's stir this up, let's stir that up. I mean, we actually wanted to get some, some stuff done. And I want to give you a, a flavor for how comprehensive this work was, and it was really, it was significant and very comprehensive. We did pass the bill. This bill, we, you hear the story all the time that we had levers. We broke this thing apart and we had levers that would move. So this bill, this is what it included. 
and there was a lot of stuff in it, and you'll hear how we compromised. Not all of us had a component to put in the bill. We had, um, we, moved, we, moved the, we moved the story, at the day in 2013, the pension unfunded liability was 97 billion. Now it's 135 billion, so it tells you how every day time is money and how you keep going in the hole. But we moved the lever by two billion for age increases for retirees. We moved the lever by eight billion for what's called the effective rate of return, which is something that's still being, you guys finance people know this stuff, yeah. We moved the lever by 15 billion for capping salaries for retirees. So in other words, you can't, you know, if you're making 60,000 and you retire in two years, you, you gotta hold at 60 versus, we're gonna give you a salary increase to 90. That was a $15 billion savings. We looked at the biggest lever, which the 3% compounded cost of living increases every year. By moving that to a simple CPI rate, that moved the lever by 95 billion. That's how big that is. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's the, that defines the major problem there. We looked at, and this is, I'm gonna stress this one, we looked at actually using actuarial tables for a 30-year plan versus what we've been doing lately, kicking the can down the road and stuff, and that saved 35 billion. And then we looked at putting more money in. That was my compromise. And we, by putting more money in, we were saving another, another 35 million. And, and that, that's kind of like, I'll compromise with that. I don't think we should put more in, but I'll compromise with that. And then the other thing we had in there too, and this is not well understood, we actually had a consideration piece in there. And it had to do with employees that if they, you know, if they would accept this change to them, they could decrease their contribution, employee contribution by 1%. So there was a consideration component in there. And the thing that I was glad for is we actually opened it up for a defined contribution plan for universities did that for teachers and um, state employees of the rest. So we opened a window for defined contributions. So we did a lot of stuff. And unfortunately it got kicked out. But the problem's still there. This, the story I'm trying to bring to the table here is that things can be solved in this state. There's ways to do this. We can get stuff done. But we have to have the political will to do that. And it, and, and, and it can be done. I mean, we can get ourselves out of the hole. This can be done. So that's, I, I wanted to share that with you to talk about what I'd like to see the Comptroller Office then turn into going forward. And I know last week, Jim, you were talking about um, you know, some of the policy ideas you would like to bring to the table too. And, and a couple of the things that we were talking about, and um, I'm, I'm with this also, is that putting the two offices together, very few states have the two offices is separate. The three states that do, one is Illinois, one's California, and one, one is New York, that have actually a comptroller and a treasurer as being two separate constitutional offices. The majority of states um, have what's called a treasurer's office. They don't have a comptroller. Texas has a comptroller, but majority have a treasurer. So Jim, as we talk about who's gonna do what, you've got the treasurer running against now, so I guess that means something there. Yeah, but the majority of states do just have one treasurer's office. I uh, give you an example on how this works, and there's always the talk about, well, the, you know, something happened in 1950 where somebody embezzled some money so you can't put the two together. I mean, that's, that's not the case at all. I mean, that, that's not the case whatsoever, because most states don't work that way. Um, I'm going to give you an example of a treasurer's office that, and some of the stuff they do, and these are some of the things I like to see us working on also, and it's really good stuff for the state of Illinois. I'm going to use Indiana as an example, because I grew up in Indiana, not that um, they're the only one out there, but it's, it's, these are some good examples of what they do. The treasurer there is the trustee for the pension funds of the state which is an important thing to have, and I want to share that background as I talked. I worked for a bank in the trust department, so I understand fiduciary, um, ex what you need to be a fiduciary and how important that is. Uh, the treasurer's um, constitutional office has a, their um, education savings program, similar to like what we have here in Illinois. They also have what's called Trust Indiana. And what Trust Indiana is, and this is interesting, it's the local government investment pool for police and fire pensions to invest in a pool if they want. So it's kind of good in that regard, because again, your locals all have to hire uh, pension consultants and pay for fees and everything else. So they have a 
basically a pool if they want to opt in to do that, but it's a common pool for investment, which saves some money. And then the other thing they have, which is kind of neat, they have a, the treasurer, and it's a woman, she's the chair for the Indiana Bond Bank. And what the Indiana Bond Bank does is it basically is a place where schools and, and municipalities can go for infrastructure borrowing, which makes some sense too, to save some money. So there's some really good things that can be done um, with putting the two together, but it has to be in the right hands and, and with the right people and doing the right thing. The thing Indiana has also, which this is another, this is the thing we have to change here also in Illinois, and it's a big risk for us. They have a large reserve pool of money, so if there's an economic downturn, they have things they can rely on without, unlike the state of Illinois, goes in the hole every year when we do have an economic downturn because we don't have reserves to draw on. So it's a lot of good good policy work. So that's kind of an example of what, what we can do and what I like to see done in that combined office also is more of a, this is a one-stop place which we're kind of doing some of this today, that you can go to if you need information to make decisions, whether you be a taxpayer, someone who's working with the state, a vendor, or a legislator, to say, give me the numbers, tell me how things are working. And it should be that. Now, we're doing more of that today. I like the transparency work that's being done by the current comptroller. Uh, you know, they're showing that here's, you know, agencies have unpaid bills and whatever, and, and all that stuff is good stuff. But you know, we're talking only about the agencies, and we're not talking about the other pieces of state finance that really need to be known. And I just talked about the biggest problem we have in the state, and that really needs to be known, and that's, uh, that's the pension problem that's out there. That needs to be out there. We need to have information, so if you're in the General Assembly and you wanna know where things are, you have a go-to for a resource to see what's going on. If you're a taxpayer, you get a sense for what this problem really is. The other day, and this is, this is, this is just basic financial stuff and it's growing. The other day, uh, an organization called Truth and Accounting did a comparison between all 50 states to say, here's where we are statewide in regards to your liabilities comparatively and they came out with a record for Illinois. And Illinois, if you can imagine, what grade do you think we got? A through F. F. <laughs> We're 48, we got an F. I mean, it's, it's yeah, we got, we got a flat out, we got an F. And here's, here's what's going on, and this is why, this is what I'll bring to the table, and this is why this is so important. What is going on, coming up in 2018, states are gonna have to report their, um, basically their liabilities on retiree health care costs. And we're one of the five states that have not done that yet. And when you open that up and you add that to the equation of all the other debt that we have, including our unpaid bills, including our borrowing, including our pension liabilities and the retiree health care cost, is almost $225 billion. And that equates to, and this is why if you're a voter, you need to understand that. For every taxpayer, that equates to 50800 bucks per taxpayer. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's disclosure. That's honesty with the numbers. That's disclosure. And that's, that's what I want to bring to the office, and that's what I want to bring to Illinois, is disclosure. I'm not being political. Um, if, and I'm going to be elected, because we're going to win this wild card, um, what I'd like to do going forward is to share that information, to share that information in a way that you get it and you understand it, and you can use it for decision making. Now, we need to do, um, What's going on today, and I'll be, I'll be honest with it, I mean, there, Susanna Mendoza, she's using that office basically to bash the governor. We've seen that firsthand. Uh, we have some stories in there also that she walks out of her lane and she calls shots that she shouldn't be calling, which is totally wrong because that's messing around with you and messing around with your tax dollars, and that needs to end. As your, as your treasurer comptroller or whatever you want to call it, you know, there, I'm going to be, I mean, you don't see, actually you don't see Jesse White and Ferrix going around bashing the governor like Mendoza does, which is just wrong. It's just wrong. So we should be using those independent constitutional offices to add value to the table. I will sit with the governor, no matter if it's a Democrat or Republican, and I've done this before, in December and January when we're crafting budgets. We should be at the table. I will be in Springfield. 
when the General Assembly and the members are going through appropriation committees to talk about, here's, here's what the facts are, guys. This is how it works type of thing. So this has to, I'm running for comptroller to make these changes. There's a lot that can be done, and there's a lot of good work that can be done, and those changes need to be made. And we were just talking a little bit, um, and I know earlier when I was in Springfield about how, you know, and I shared the story about how we worked across the aisle and we had a group of people and, and we trust each other and we got something done and we actually quantified some really good things. We need more of that today. We really do. We need to move the state forward and, and solve problems. And we can solve problems, but you need to get the right people elected to do that. So I am asking, I'm, I'm glad you guys listened to my story today. You know, I'm asking for your support going forward. I will. Um, I will serve you for four years, unlike someone who's running or is current comptroller that won't say yes, she's not running for mayor, and won't say no, she's not, uh, she is running for mayor or not running for mayor, she won't say either way type of thing. But that's, that bothers me because, you know, you get elected, or she wants that comptroller, she's running for that race, you get elected, and then the first thing you're doing is running for mayor, and that's wrong. You should be working for the people of Illinois. If you're gonna, if you're gonna write me a check, a contribution, if you're gonna vote for me for comptroller, you need to be there for four years and do the work. And that's what I will commit to you to do that. So it's a, like I said, my story's been good. Um, I've loved what I've done. I want to continue to do the good work for Illinois. I want to keep these guys here, <laughs> even though I think they're ready to leave right now. <laughs> it's like enough already. So that, that's it. And I want to thank you for listening. And I know we're going to open the questions. Darlene, thank you very much. And are you ready for a few yep. Q and A's? Okay. If anybody has any question that you would like to ask of uh, Darlene, what sir. Oh, there, Senate when Senate Bill One, we did we we moved the we basically reduced the liability by ninety million with all those factors. Yeah. Yeah, with all of the above, right. So it was a lot. I mean, there's a lot, and, and I like, I want to share that part of it because there's still, there's a lot of levers, there's a lot of ways to solve this thing. You know, we just need to get the pieces in place to do it. Uh, you know, there, and this is one other thing too, there, I don't think the state can go bankrupt unless the federal government says it has the ability to do it. That's my understanding. I'm not a, I'm a finance person, not an attorney, but. All around the country, that's what people are taking on There it's, you know, that, that's, if, let me put it this way. If, if, if you're a household and you had to pay that 50,000, you're gonna be out of, out of your house. <laughs> I mean, that's. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Um, this is from Bruce Hansen, who's affiliated with the Institute on Public Policy for People with Disabilities. Um, Darlene, what areas do you think are ripe for the picking to save taxpayers money in the comptroller's area of responsibility? If elected, how quickly could you achieve these savings? So that's kind of a two-part question. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So the, the first part is um, right for the picking to save taxpayer money in the comptroller's area of responsibility. Here's, here's one thing that needs to be done. And um, Leslie Munger, who was appointed to fill a four-year term, um, it's not here, but she signed up right away for it. There's a new system, technology system, for our financial systems to talk to one another that is being implemented in all the agencies, and the comptroller should have that system in also. Um, Mendoza kicked that out immediately. So that's one of the things I'd like to put in place. It's, it's gonna save us money. Um, one of the reasons why the agents rate agencies didn't want to do the additional bills every month is because it costs money. It's, it's very labor intensive to do that. So these systems would, would save us a lot and give us good information to work with. And then right out of the gate, 
if you, um, here's, here's how it works with the treasurer and the comptroller being combined. It's not the General Assembly that chooses to put the two together. It's to put something on the ballot for you to vote, up or down type of thing. And if you choose to put the two offices together, I mean immediately right out of the gate, there's two people looking at each other become one. So that saves some money there. And then all the redundancies and IT and general counsels and the rest. So Thank you. Oh, we've got a couple more questions here. <clears throat> This is from Dan Patlack, who's the commissioner with the Cook County Board of Review. Dan, you're not a city club member. Where are oh. you? <laughs> 35 bucks. You become a member of the city club. $50, sorry. $50. No other, no other requirement. We don't do any DNA. We don't do any DNA testing or anything like that. So consider it. By the way, tax deductible. Okay. Here's Dan's question. How would you run the comptroller's office differently than the incumbent? The, you know, and again, there will be quite a few differences. Uh, number one, when it comes to paying bills, I want to see the politics taken out of the bill payment process entirely. I would bring in a independent third party to make those decisions, kind of an arbitrator to kind of work that stuff out so we keep politics um, out of it. And then number two, as we just talked about, there's a lot of power there that can be used for educating and more um, real transparent um, financial information on where our state really is. So I would take it much further than what we're doing today and, and saying, you know, there's, there's numbers out there, but they're not very user friendly. So I would basically turn it into something you could use. Big you know, difference. One of the things that you mentioned, Darlene, was um, there are five states that haven't uh, released certain information. Um, Illinois was one. Well, let me ask this question. Whose responsibility is that to release? Is it the Comptroller's Office? Or could the Governor go ahead and release that kind of information? Yeah, and I don't, you know, this has to do with the um, retiree health care component right. again that hasn't been, we haven't reported it yet. Now, um, it'll come from, how, how it works basically, it'll come from the governor's office and various agencies that are keeping track of these things, and then it goes to the comptroller for the, the comptroller is responsible for the report that comes out every year for the audit, and the Cal, it's called the CalFirst report. So it'll be the comptroller to report it, but it'll come from other places. So let me ask you if the governor could do that, we're in a, we have a gubernatorial race also, in addition to your race and Mr. Dodge's race. Um, wouldn't it be in his interest, Governor Rauner's interest, to get this information out before the election in November? I know you can't speak for the I, I That's exactly what I was going to say. I but can't speak, your thoughts. speak on it. You know, there, this, you know this, the information is out there. Um, here's, and, and I think it should be out there, but here's, here's the problem with that information. We're not wrapping our heads around it like we should be. And I'll, I'll cite an example on there. I'm, I'm, at, I'm with the Tribune editorial board uh, last week, and the problem came up, or the question came up, is, okay, um, and I'm not talking about the governor, but I'm talking with uh, Comptroller Mendoza. So it's like, okay, Mendoza, what do you, what's your opinion in regards to how we solve this pension problem? And she's, she's like, well, you know, I don't want any amendment changing the constitutional law because, you know, I don't want to diminish and impair anything right now. Well, then how are you going to solve it? And her answer was, we're going to legalize marijuana and we're going to tax it. <laughs> I know. And we're going, to, we're going to make gaming bigger. So, you know, if you're thinking that way, you don't have your head wrapped around what this is at all. And, and that's kind of, you know, this stuff should be out there so we can get one's head wrapped around it. Yeah, I uh, yes. I, I just want to comment that I, I, you know, I heard the number $130 billion in unfunded pension liability, but some of the leading economists, and that is what's reported, and legitimately because states can use really favorable assumptions about you know, what's going to happen with their money going forward. But the, Josh Rao, for example, an economist at Stanford and many others say that it's actually three times that much. And we are 
vastly, in a way, I believe, the worst state in the nation in terms of our unfunded pension liability. So if, uh, just underscoring what you've already said, Darlene, it's a massive problem that I don't think people really appreciate. No, they, they, they're not recognizing that this is, the, this is big. We've had many speakers at the City Club, uh, yourself, uh, Larry Massal from the Civic mm -hmm. Federation and others talk about this issue. Yet no one really seems to be really dealing with this in a way to, everybody sort of comes out with the same platitudes. Um, do you think that if Governor Rauner is reelected, that there will be movement on this issue? Just your thoughts. You know, he does bring up the problem, you know, and, and he brings it up in a term of one of the things I just talked about already with the consideration component, and that's to, you know, hopefully get it passed once and for all. So that that's being talked about, um, no question. Here's, here's what needs to be done, and we did it once before. We need to have the political will to do it on all camps and all parties to make that happen again. And, and we can solve this. We can get something done. But we need to go back to that square one and get the political will to do it. And if you hear answers such as taxing marijuana is the way to get around it, <laughs> that's not the political will to, to move, us, move us forward. So I, I, yeah, I believe it can be done. We've done this before. Okay, and by the way, uh, the City Club, uh, we've had various speakers address us in this election year. We just haven't been able to get uh, Governor Rauner's schedule to mesh with our schedule. So if you see your boss later, tell him we are open. There is still time before the election for him to come and speak to three or 400 people who are very interested. Mark, she doesn't have to text them. Okay. That's good. Been texting them all the people. Hey, good. Excellent. This question is from Dr. Yerkes, right down here. Uh, he's a write-in candidate for Illinois the Illinois Congressional District Three. 5. Three. Three. Is that where the gentleman who's sort of a, a pro-Nazi managed to get on the ballot because the Republican Party wasn't uh, too alert? It's so, okay, so that's the famous district. So that gives us a frame of reference. Good luck to you. Um, here's his question. We don't have a Democrat or Republican problem. We have a math problem. You must have known you went to Purdue. Okay. Please comment. If we borrow without any intention of paying it back, that is stealing. It doesn't cut. Any corners there? Your thoughts? It, yeah, that's that's. I like your statement. That's a pretty, I mean, that's, that's a pretty, that's a statement. Yeah, that's a good answer. statement. Yeah. I like the statement. I mean, there, yeah, I mean, it's, we need to be real with this stuff. We really do. And you know what? It's, it goes back. Here's, you're, you're paying me money to, you know, run the state. So it's disingenuous if I don't pay, pay those loans back or take care of the problems that are out there. Absolutely. Okay, there's an answer for you, Dr. Yerkes, and everybody else. So you are in favor of merging the two offices? Yes. And is your opponent also in favor of merging the two offices? Uh, no. The history on that one, and again, it should be for a vote. So it actually, in 2012, it gets out of the Senate unanimously, and Speaker Madigan blocks it, and my opponent um, basically says, this is the worst thing since slavery. It's so bad to do, I would never consider it. Yeah. She was a member of the House of Representatives at that yes. time? Yes, yes. Her and I we actually served together. Hmm. Okay. So one cl glaring difference between the two of you certainly is on the merging of this office. Um, anyone else have any questions? Yes, sir. And, uh, you are? Steve Briggs. With? American Survey Engineering here in Chicago. Okay. okay. Excellent presentation, Darlene. Uh, back to that $235 billion. That's just on the health care costs. It has nothing to do with actual pension payments to the retirees. We're looking at two different numbers. No, that, that's, that's the aggregate, as we were just talking before, that's about the, the that's the unfunded pension liabilities and the retiree health care cost on top of, okay, yeah. Thanks, thank you, sir. Yeah, and it's like $59 million of, of retiree costs that we haven't really added on yet. Uh, 
Mrs. Murphy. Ms. Murphy. Hi. Um, I actually was wondering if you would comment on an issue that's come up a couple times for the Comptroller's office and is coming up again in state legislative races, which is no budget, no pay. Um, as you know, Leslie Munger in 2015 during the state budget and passed that legislative paychecks back up the line. Similar to what you experienced with Pat Quinn, um, Susanna Mendoza made it a signature messaging piece of her campaign and defeated Leslie Munger um, on that issue, then refused to hear out Mark Batnick, who had filed legislation for it. Now Mark Batnick's Democrat opponent is running on no budget, no pay, as are several other Democrat state legislative candidates. I was wondering politically what you think of the use of this issue, and then as a policy, would you, as comptroller, support some sort of no budget, no pay measure? You know, yeah, I mean, there obviously this is a message that's popular with the public because both sides are using it to their own, you know, saying political advantage type of thing. So it's, you know, it's something that I would want to see in place again, uh, maybe done in not just no pay type of thing, but, you know, let's go, you're not going home until we get this stuff solved type of thing. You stay in Springfield until we knock this knock this out type of stuff. So again, it's not, there. there's solutions. It's the political will to get them done. And whatever we need to do to get these problems solved, I'm for it. I'd rather hypocritical Susanna Mendoza to run on it, and then after a fight, having this lawyer has basically sued Leslie for. Right, for right, right. And, and, you know, she then starts paying legislators because he said the court said you have to do it. So she did some appeal, but it was a very weak appeal, too. So there was no real fight on her behalf. And, and it's, that's the difference between her and I. You know, I think we really need to sit down and get this stuff done. Okay, we have time for another question or two, if anyone has any question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, sorry, have you talked to Susanna I believe we're with WTTW yes. on well, what the and the Sun Times tomorrow. Yeah, and we did. We were with the Trib editorial last week, so there's there's stuff coming out. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and, and again, you know, I, I truly believe that, you know, these are, you're supposed to be independent constitutional offices, so you shouldn't be using that as a political um, position to bash others. Help them versus the bashing. Good. Okay. Folks, let's give Darlene Thank you. a round of applause.